Hello and welcome to the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. I'm Ralph Russo, the college football writer with the Associated Press. It has been a very bumpy road to get to this college football season in a pandemic, and the first few weeks of this season have been anything but smooth. Still, We've reached the point where things are starting to ramp up. This weekend will feel a lot closer to a real college football Saturday than any that have come before it. The SEC begins play. The ACC and Big 12 both have all their teams playing. If all goes according to plan, according to the schedule, which might be a lot to ask, by the way, there will be more than 30 games played and 20 ranked teams in action. We are still about a month away from the Big Ten and Pac-12 entering the fray, but this will feel like the first normal weekend of college football yet. To talk about where we are and some of the most intriguing storylines of this early season, Andy Staples of The Athletic will be our guest. We'll talk about the Big Ten schedule, Miami's new offense, what to watch for in the SEC, and we'll even talk a little bit about Deion Sanders as the new football coach at Jackson State. Really? And whatever else happens to be on Andy's mind. Thanks for listening to the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. You can find us on Westwood One Podcast, Apple Podcast, just about anywhere you like to get your podcast. If you like what you hear, give us a good review. It helps college football fans find us and it helps us find more college football fans. And away we go. Joining me this week on the podcast is Andy Staples from The Athletic, host of The Andy Staples Show, which comes out, I don't know, what, but six, like six times a week, right? You, it seems like that thing is popping up in my feed every other day at this point, Andy. How are you? And how many times are you doing your show, your, your podcast these officially, days? Officially three okay. for The Andy Staples Show. We have, we have one where we do a recap of the games that, that you can cook your breakfast too on Sunday mornings. And then we have one that comes out Wednesday morning and one that comes out Friday morning. But when there's big news, we'll throw in a, a, like an emergency episode in. So <laughs> this past few months, there's been nothing but big news. So like last week we threw in an emergency episode when the big 10 decided to come back and, you know, if something crazy were to happen this week, then we'd, we'd throw another episode in plus new podcast with, with our friend, uh, David Ubbin who covers Tennessee for us at the athletic football and grits. It's our, it's our daily sec podcast. So I'm going to be on that every Monday. And oh, so oh, you're going to be part of that one as well. Okay. Yeah. On, on Mondays. And then we've got a rotating cast. We, we have a bunch of really good beat writers who cover sec schools. And so each of them will get kind of their day of the week. So, and, and then David's the ringmaster dealing with all, all of our egos. Very, very nice. Well, if you don't subscribe to The Athletic, you should. It's very, very good stuff with a lot of my friends over there. Andy, we actually have football to talk about. You know, maybe we'll, we'll, we're going to get into a little bit of the Big Ten stuff. And so that is sort of COVID related. But like this, you know, we're taping on Tuesday. And we're going to mostly do looking ahead. And what we're looking ahead to is the first full, kind of full weekend of the season where we have the SEC and the ACC and the Big 12 all up and running. So it's looking good. It's looking like we're going to have a weekend of football, of some pretty good football to dig our teeth into. This this is going to feel more real than anything we've seen so far. Like I just pulled up the schedule. This is noon, Okay. And this, this has basically been what your whole Saturday has been up to this point. This is just noon. Kansas State, Oklahoma, Florida Ole Miss, Kentucky Auburn, UCF East Carolina, Georgia Southern Louisiana Lafayette, Louisiana Pitt, Georgia Tech Syracuse, Georgia State Charlotte, Campbell Appal- Appalachian State. And he's like, Campbell Appalachian State? Well, Campbell Appal- Appalachian State would have been the 330 game on ESPN <laughs> like two weeks ago. So this that's just noon. So I think it's going to feel pretty real on Saturday. Last week, Troy Middle Tennessee was the 330 game on ESPN. Troy Middle Tennessee was, I mean, middle. you know, God bless Middle Tennessee. They might be the worst team in FBS this year. They have been so bad. That was the that was the 330 game on ESPN. So yeah, this will absolutely feel different. Before we dig into the weekend, though, I do want to sort of hit one last time on the, on the Big Ten schedule because it was interesting to see 
listen, the headline was, oh, my God, Nebraska. Like, like Nebraska gets Ohio. You, okay, Nebraska, you want to play football. You're going to have to play some football. Are, are you in the conspiracy theorist camp of the Big Ten went out of its way to give Nebraska a little bit of a dig there through the schedule? I don't think they went out of their way, Ralph. I think what happened was they did you know, the easiest way to trim the schedules back from what they had originally back on August 5th. And this is what they came up with. And they looked at it and they're like, that sounds about right. <laughs> when they looked at Nebraska's because yeah, I'm sure the conference office is not pleased with Nebraska. I think everybody who likes football in the big 10 should be ecstatic with Nebraska and thank Nebraska for its efforts because it was the one that came out first and said, this is wrong. It actually came out the day before the Big Ten postponed on August 11th and said, this is a bad decision. They shouldn't do this and kept the fight to them the whole time. Ohio State joined in. Iowa obviously was was all along in that that mix. Penn State's football people, James Franklin and and the team and uh, Michigan's football people, Jim Harbaugh and the team joined in. Now their administrations didn't because they voted to postpone. But I think people in the big 10 should be thanking Nebraska, but yeah, I, I'm sure the conference office, which was made to look like a bunch of clowns by Nebraska probably doesn't feel particularly bad about giving Nebraska this gauntlet to run through. Nebraska starts the season at Ohio state and then plays Wisconsin the next week. And then also plays Penn state in week four. They are the only West division team that has Two of the three Eastern powers this year, the three Eastern powers being Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State. You know, usually it's four Eastern powers because we throw in Michigan State in there, but Michigan State looks like they're going to have a bit of a rebuild year. Mm -hmm. Uh, So no other West school has two of the three powerhouse teams, Uh, but Nebraska's got that. Again, Nebraska gets Ohio State. You know, the other thing too is Bill Moose, I'm not, I don't want to completely relitigate what the Big Ten did, but I will say this. Bill Moose came out this weekend and sort of said, well, you know, he had clearly pushed for some more tinkering to be done with the schedule to try to find a little more balance there. And Bill Moose is the athletic director for Nebraska. And I get that. I told listen, you, your, your job is to fight for your school. And Nebraska has a sort of an up and coming program that it thinks could be improving. And that's no way to get your improving program on the right track is to throw it at the, you know, the wolves of the Buckeyes the first week of the season. However, it should be noted that Nebraska, Ohio State is a has become a yearly thing in the Big Ten. And the intent was right. we have these two traditional powerhouse programs. We want them playing as often as possible. The other thing, too, is for many years when Nebraska first entered the Big Ten, Nebraska folks would complain about their home schedules because, oh, my God, we're playing Illinois and Minnesota. Like, why don't we get a chance to play the big teams like like Michigan and Ohio State? So having Ohio State as a yearly game every other year at Lincoln was something of a concession might not be the right word was a gift to Nebraska. Hey, we're going to give you Ohio state every year. Shouldn't you be excited? And now of course they're saying, no, we would rather like pass on Ohio state a little bit. So it kind of works a little bit both ways here. It's almost as if Nebraska tends to complain about actions by its conference office (laughs) frequently, regardless of conference. There is a history here is what we're saying. Exactly. No, I mean, look, I see both sides of this. And I don't think there was any sort of massive conspiracy to stick Nebraska with a terrible schedule. I think it was a case where they did the easiest thing and they looked at it at the end and we're happy that Nebraska got a terrible schedule. <laughs> they just so happened to. Yeah. Because, right. We're not going to, we're not going to try to give Nebraska a terrible schedule, but we're also but not going to try to. Nebraska winds up with a terrible schedule. Right. Well, what could be done? Yes. So every, yeah, it just happened to work out that way. All right. So that's the big 10. Let's dive into this week's games. And, you know, Miami got a lot of attention because, hey, listen, they, they two weeks in a row, they, they look like they have a real offense. And for a long time, I know you've been saying, hey, this is the offense Miami should have been playing for years. They finally have it now with Rhett Lashley as the offensive coordinator, De'Ara King as the quarterback. 
if this looks like a sustainable thing. I know it's only UAB and Louisville, but that's, you know, competition comparable to what they'll see the rest of the year in the ACC. What I want to ask you about is Rhett Lashley. It's been an interesting road for Rhett Lashley. I remember, I don't know if you remember this, but you and I standing next to each other during the coordinator sessions at the 2013 championship game. So 2014, I guess it would have been uh, with Auburn and Florida State. Florida State. Yeah. Rhett Lashley is the offensive coordinator for Auburn, and Jeremy Pruitt, if I remember correctly, was the was the defensive coordinator for Florida State that year. Correct. Right? I remember Andy Staples telling me how many years before it's this game and it's head coach Rhett Lashley and head coach Jeremy Pruitt. Jeremy Pruitt's a head coach now. Rhett Lashley yep. has taken an odd path to where he has been. Walk through well, that when, path. When, when and, your path takes you to Randy Edsel's UConn, yeah, it's not as Cut and dried. But the thing about Jeremy, you know, the the difference between the two of those at that time is Jeremy Pruitt was calling the defense. He was the defensive coordinator on Jimbo Fisher's team. Jimbo Fisher has nothing to do with the defense. Rhett Lashley was the offensive coordinator on Gus Malzahn's team. Gus Malzahn was calling plays at the time. You know, Gus Gus didn't get play calling wrestled away from him for a few more years, and that that's its own saga in and of itself is, you know, Gus got play calling wrestled away and then Rhett got to follow plays. And then, but it was, there was still friction and, and Rhett goes to Connecticut to do his own thing. And he realizes working at Connecticut under Randy Edsel, probably not the, the greatest career move. The, the, the offense was very good. The, the team was terrible, yes. but the offense was very, very good that year. Correct. And then he goes and works with Sonny Dykes at SMU. And I think that, I think that was a very helpful thing for Rhett because he got to see how a little bit different, you know, offense functions. And the thing was, he was, he was like kind of back in the same situation of a head coach who calls the plays, who's in a, it was very hands-on with the offense, but he took away from that a slightly different offense that I think is a very good mix for today's game because, you know, the Gus offense is very inside run heavy if you can't run between the tackles, it doesn't really work that well in the pass game. The Dykes offense is more air raid based. It's it's a lot of catch and throw by the quarterback. And so if you marry concepts from those two things, there's almost nothing you can't do in that offense. And I think you're seeing that. Now, it helps that he's got a quarterback in Derek King who has played in about as many different spread offenses Rhett Lashley has coached in. You know, listen, I'm not, I haven't been able to break down the X's and O's of where this offense is. I've just watched the two games. Does it, does it feel closer to the Gus offense to you? Cause that's what it looks closer. I, and I have not gotten a chance to really break it all down either. But when I look at a lot of the stuff they do, especially the pre-step motion personnel packages, that sort of, it, it looks to the naked eye much closer to Gus's office. That, that is my layperson's read now, too. I've been sort of saying, I think, you know, Cameron Harris might be Trey Mason. I have made the same comparison. Trey, and, and, and it's interesting because people think of what happened to Trey Mason after college, but Trey Mason in 2013 was a dominant running back. Mm-hmm. Dominant. But he also came out of sort of, quote unquote, nowhere, right? I mean, he, yep. he, I don't think people peg Trey Mason to be a Heisman candidate the way, you know, you you would, let's say, a Najee Harris this year in preseason. Right. Uh, so it was clearly also being married into that offense where, again, a lot of inside stuff, a lot of that motion that moves people around. You know, listen, Louisville had some titanic defensive oh, bus on so Saturday. So, so bad. But some of that, I think, is at least a little bit of a byproduct of you're moving some people around and you're trying to get to some of that eye candy to get people to be confused, make bad decisions. Now, again, Louisville made some really bad decisions. So, I, you know, I, again, like having not like done the all 22 work here, how much is Louisville breakdown and how much was Miami's offense? But again, to me, I felt like I've been watching more of the Auburn offense which again went to a national championship with Nick Marshall and Trey yeah, Mason. And and who is Derek King if not a much better throwing Nick Marshall? Yeah, he is and he's about the same size. I mean Derek King's a, not a big dude. Both great runners, mm-hmm. but Derek King throws a much more catchable ball. Yeah. So is Lashley now a guy, you know, Brent Lashley is also, you know, I have to, I have to google it. He can't be more than 38. 
right? I mean, he can't be much more than than that. He is still a super young guy. But uh, you know, it's it's funny. I think he is now back on the path of you know, listen, if things go really well this year, maybe he's a head coach by next year, though. I don't know if there's going to be a ton of movement this I, year. Yeah, the, Miami may luck out in that it's a short, a small coaching carousel just because people don't have money or people decided this year is a mulligan for whoever, you know, whatever their coach is. But yeah, I think solving the Miami offense, which has been a problem for years, I mean, they have not had a really good functional offense at Miami since I don't know. Yeah, it's, I been, mean, yeah, it's been a while. Brock, Brock Berlin was the quarterback. I mean, it's been a while since they've been explosive on offense. It, now, defensively, they've been pretty good the last four or five years. And so the thought was, if you could get the offense to even just barely functional, they're a pretty good team. If this offense is going to be good, they could be one of the better teams in the ACC. So I think Brett Lashley will get a lot of credit for that. And deservedly so. And you're right. I actually talked to Manny Diaz about this in February because he's he's aware that what the situation is and whoever comes in and makes the Miami offense work is going to get a head coaching job. Mm -hmm. The other the other possibility that you have to worry about if this offense is very successful. And I realize I'm sorry, Miami fans, that we're doing this after two games. (laughs) You've gotten to enjoy a good offense for two games and now we're trying to take it away from you. But the other issue you may have is Rhett Lashley may get hired by a defensive-minded head coach in the SEC for two and a half million dollars. Mm-hmm. That's, That's the other point. the other thing you got to fend off. Now, I think Rhett wants to be a head coach. I think he's got the right temperament for it. I think he recruits well enough for it. I think he's he's put in his time, so he definitely deserves a chance to be a head coach. But if the right opportunity doesn't come along, an opportunity like that may come along too, and he he would just have to decide what what he wants and. Honestly, I think being the offensive coordinator for a defensive minded head coach where people know. So now there's no mystery anymore. It's not how, what, what percentage is Gus calling and what percentage is Rhett calling. Rhett is calling 100% of the place. Mm-hmm. It's working. So he will have a chance, I think, to improve upon his stature as the season goes. And if there are head coaching jobs, I would imagine he would be at the top of some lists if this offense keeps, keeps doing what it's doing. So now you mentioned functional offense, and it's been a minute since we've seen really functional offense at Florida State, and that's the (laughs) one of the big games this week. It's going to be the uh, you know the eight p.m. game. We're getting a ton of the U right now, right? Two weeks in a row, the U is in is in prime time. Florida State. You know, Mike Norvell's debut looked a lot like a lot of Willie Taggart's games, which was, you know, wow, this, we got this offense humming in the first two drives, and then that all goes away, and then the defense, which is pretty good, can't keep up and, and gives up a lead, and Florida State has lost the game. Now Mike Norvell uh, has tested positive for COVID, so he will be out this week, at least on the on pers- in-person duties. I, I, you know, it's hard to tell through the first couple of weeks of the season, what exactly we're seeing here and how much of a first game, I mean, even during normal times, right? The first game, the difference between a first game and a second game can be drastically different. Teams obviously improve throughout the season, but in this particular season, it's becoming even harder to figure out what we might see from week to week. We don't even know what players are going to show up from week to week. Is there anything that you saw out of Florida State's first game that would make you go, okay, like maybe there's reason for hope here because this was bad, but this maybe can get better. It seems like their offensive line is still a little bit of a mess, but maybe a little better than it has been. I, I don't know. Is it possible we'll see a, a new type of Florida State this weekend? Well, I think the the offensive line starting five is workable. But what you saw in the Georgia Tech game was as soon as so, some of those guys started getting hurt, and the first guy to get hurt was Dante Lucas, and it was actually on that long bomb where Blackman put it right where it needed to be and, and Tamari and Terry dropped it and it would have been a walk-in touchdown mm. right at the end of the first half. Okay. Changes the game, Dante, really. Dante Lucas gets hurt on that play. I would argue that his injury changed the game more than the drop touchdown pass mm-hmm. changed the game because he was the first member of the starting five to go down. And then once you get into their depth on the offensive line, they don't, they just don't work as well. And, and so during that game, four members of the starting five on the offensive line went out at various times. They, they did eventually, I think they all came back at some point or another, but I don't know that they ever played all together again in the game. And it just, 
the chemistry didn't work and they couldn't move the ball at all. People are saying, well, okay, how about a different quarterback? Well, Jordan Travis, you know what you're getting from him. He's a, he's a runner. When he's in there, he's running. And defenses are going to stack the boxes. They're just not scared of him throwing the ball. And the, the one time I, I remember him throwing the ball against Georgia Tech, it did not go very well. And so it just doesn't seem like they're that confident calling a lot of passes for him. So the offense can be one dimensional when you bring him in. I don't know that that helps. So what do you do? I mean, I think the thought was when Chubba Purdy signed with them, because Chubba Purdy was going to Louisville. This is a little brother of Brock Purdy. He's from mm-hmm. the Phoenix area. They flipped him with the promise of, of potential early playing time. Not, not promising him the job, but promising that he could come in and compete for the starting job. And he might have been able to, except there was a pandemic. And then when he did get to start practicing, he broke his collarbone. So that, that you know, set things back a bit. But a collarbone injury is not a season-long injury. He will be back within the next few weeks. And the question is, has he missed too much time? Does it matter? But, I mean, look at Shane Illingworth at Oklahoma State. He had missed a bunch of time during camp. He's a true freshman, sort of the same boat. And he came in and saved their bacon. Mm -hmm. So it may just be if if Chubba Purdy gets back and he's healthy, even though he hasn't really spent much time in the offense, he still may give you the best chance. Mm -hmm. So that's something they they need to – they'll have to evaluate and think about going forward. But, you know, that's, that's the thing that I was wondering was if Chubba had been healthy, would he have been the day one starter? Fill in the uh, the blanks for me here, because a lot was made of when Georgia Tech beats Florida State of Jeff Sims, who is an, a nice freshman quarterback for the Yellow Jackets. He had been a Florida State commit. Was the situation where Norvell wanted Purdy, and that's why Sims left? Did he like flip his commitment to Georgia Tech? Florida State had... Sims committed mm-hmm. under Willie Taggart. When Taggart was fired, Sims took a couple official visits. He, he took an official visit to Maryland and one to Georgia Tech because they, he didn't know who was going to get hired, didn't know what was going to happen, didn't know if that person was going to want him when he got there. And so Norvell gets the job. Norvell had liked Tate Rodemaker, who's from Valdosta, Georgia, at Memphis. But Rodemaker had not been interested in Memphis He ended up committing to USF, where former Valdosta State coach Kerwin Bell was the offensive coordinator. That staff got fired. Rodemaker suddenly on the market. And Norvell picks up Rodemaker. But they were always going to take two two QBs in the class. Right, because they had been way behind a QB at Florida State. Willie Taggart had not taken a high school quarterback yet. So he didn't in in his first two classes, he didn't take a high school quarterback. So they were going to take two. And yeah, Kenny Dillingham and Norvell. Kenny Dillingham is the offense coordinator at Florida State. He's a former Phoenix area high school coach. Norvell worked at Arizona State, knows that area well. So Chubba Purdy was a big deal in that area. And the fact that he might be interested because of the idea of early playing time, because Malik Cunningham was was pretty entrenched at Louisville. That job was not going to be open. Mm-hmm. And so... The, the pitch to Chubb Purdy is you may be able to come in and play. The opportunity will be there for you. And so he took it. And that's why Jeff Sims was uh, Sims sort of read the writing on the wall. And that all went down within days of signing day. Yeah. And it all, and Sim, and it all might work Sims out. Signed yeah, with Georgia Tech. yeah. And it all might work out great for everyone if Purdy comes back and is a, is, you know, good. And you, I, you're right. I think there's a very strong possibility. You know, listen, I, I feel bad for James Blackman. The kid has not had a really, I, I would, what I would call a fair shake. And, and what I mean by that is not that he hasn't had the opportunity to win the job, but there's been so much turmoil around him and he was thrown in so yeah. soon. Uh, well, I, I just don't know if he ever had a fair opportunity to be developed the way a quarterback should be. But the fact of the matter is at this point, he might just be what he is. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, it it stinks for James Blackman because he was, he was signed by Jimbo Fisher as a developmental type player. Right. The idea for James Blackman was you'd never play him until probably he was a red shirt junior. You would give him time to grow, time to learn the offense, all that. But he comes in at a time when, remember, DeAndre Johnson should have been there, yep. but he got thrown out of school because he punched a woman at a bar. Malik Henry should have been there, but Malik Henry was was a bust. Mm-hmm. 
And so there wasn't anybody behind DeAndre Francois when Francois got hurt against Alabama in the first game of, of the 17 season. And so James Blackman got thrown in and, and right. All of that developmental time is gone. He's just suddenly running for his life behind a bad offensive line, playing a very complicated offense that he wasn't supposed to have learned yet. So, I mean, that, that's the thing. I, he sort of came out behind the eight ball. And, but, but yeah, I, I think we might be to the point where this is what you're going to get with him, and you know that. So you have to make decisions based on that going forward. So since we're in Florida, let let me ask this question. Um, because Dylan Gabriel said it, uh, U- UCF he called the the UCF quarterback said we are the best team in Florida after last week when uh, they beat Georgia Tech, they beat the brakes off of Georgia Tech. Uh, the Knights did uh, the week after Georgia Tech beats Florida State. Now, of course, the Gators haven't played a game yet, and Miami is 2-0. and So there's a lot of debate there, but it's fun, and I think that there could be a couple of pretty good teams in the state of Florida. Uh, can, can, well, can, can, I, can I make an alteration to it? Because I, I don't know who the best team is. Again, like you said, the Gators haven't played. <laughs> Miami looks good. But with all due respect to Kyle Trask and Derek King, former Mandel High School teammates, oh, who I, I see think where are you're both going. great quarterbacks. Yeah. I think Dylan Gabriel is the best quarterback in the state of Florida. If you have a hard time convincing me, he's not. And Trask is very good. And and again, Derek King has looked very good. But boy, I I think Dylan Gabriel is uh, has a chance to be, you know, a top he's, five he's or special. ten quarterback in the country. Yeah. Like five quarterback, he has a chance to be top five by the time he's done. Uh, I think he could be a legit Heisman guy. He looked really good last year, even as a freshman. I love the fact that, and, and I love the fact that this offense loves to go deep. Uh, that they do not shy away from taking shots, uh, and, and he does it really well. Yeah, I like him a lot. I, I went on a rant on on my podcast on on Sunday because. It just bothers me that for the most of his recruitment, Dylan Gabriel was was going to Army to run the option. <laughs> like he was committed to Army. How did that many college coaches watch video of his games and think, no, no, no sure, let's go let him run the option? Now, Dylan- How do you watch him throw a football <laughs> on video and not immediately call and say, you know what? I'd like to look at you know, look at this guy a little further. I mean, for UCF to get him, it took Mackenzie Milton, their quarterback who was starting at the time, who played at the same high school. Mm-hmm. Dylan Gabriel was his successor at that high school. Mackenzie Milton kept going to Josh Heupel on Friday nights during dinner before you know they're, they're at the game at the Ghost Hotel or at the the hotel on a road game site, and they're having dinner. And Mackenzie Milton's going to Josh Heupel. You got to check out my guy. You got to check out my guy. You got to check out my guy. Every Friday night. And Heupel's finally like, shut up. Fine. I'll look at him. And he looks at him. He's like, oh, yeah, we need this guy. And so he gets committed to, to UCF. And then USC and Georgia jump in. But, like, how is everybody not all over this dude? <laughs> you know, it, it brings me – you mentioned Heupel – he, you know, I think a lot of people were a little skeptical when when he was hired as the replacement to Scott Frost because he had had a little bit of a rough ride, right? You know, Hypo was a guy who got bounced by his alma mater, o- Oklahoma, as an offensive coordinator, and he landed at Missouri and did a good job there. But I think there was just this skepticism of like, hey, UCF is in such a great place, and 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 like Josh Josh Hypo, that's like sort of the best you can do there. And there was this, you know, which happens a lot, this thought that well, they just wanted some. Somebody who wouldn't leave quickly, right? They just they they just had a, a deal with Frost where Frost did great, but he was gone in two years, and they they zoned in on Hypo because they figured like here's a guy we know we can keep around for a little while, and those type of hires, you know, have a track record of being a little iffy. But I got to tell you, I mean, considering the expectations at UCF when he walked in there and how well they have played so far, and you know maybe to a certain degree. I don't know Hypo that well, but I've gotten to know him a little bit. Maybe he was like the right guy to replace Frost. Frost is certainly a, a little bit of a hard ass, and I, not that not that Hypo's you know not a tough coach, but I just wonder if there's a there's a certain like there was there was a different approach that Hypo brought in there that might have been a good complement to the way Frost was building things, and it's really worked out great for UCF. And again, considering the level of expectations, it's been pretty impressive what Heupel's been able to sustain there. Oh, it's very impressive. And, and the thing is, 
nothing of, of what he did at Oklahoma suggested this was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And he had to go rehabilitate his career. He had to go to Utah State, and then he was at Missouri. And you, you still didn't know that he'd be able to manage a program like this, but he's been fantastic there. I mean, let's be honest. He won a, he won a bunch of games his first year. He was undefeated in the regular season. They lost to LSU in the Fiesta Bowl, which when you look back on that now, you're like, oh, because you could, you know, if, when you watch Joe Burrow in that Fiesta Bowl, you could see the seeds of what was coming. Yeah, we didn't realize it but at you, the time. But yes, that was the that was the hey, this is what we got in store for you next year game. Yeah. So they lost that game. That's the only game they lose his first year. And then last year they lost three games by a total of seven points. I mean, they were a good team last year. They they happened to play some other good team. Like now they shouldn't have lost to Tulsa. Let's let's be honest. That that shouldn't have happened. But losing to Cincinnati, there's no shame in that. Mm-hmm. Losing at Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh's got some really good players. They haven't put it all together, but they got a bunch of NFL talent on that roster. So I, I don't really kill Hypel over that one either. I, I think he's done a really good job there. And I'm excited to see the American race this year because I think Luke Fickle has a great program going at Cincinnati. It looks like Ryan Silverfield has has done well in the takeover at Memphis, although they can't seem to get the COVID stuff under control. Yeah, Got to get on the field. <laughs> yeah. You've got Houston with a much improved roster. So they're, they're going to be an interesting piece of that puzzle. I just think that's going to be a really interesting conference. And, and, you know, the team that wins the American is going to be pretty good. And, and you forgot the team that that I think has been getting a little overlooked, and that's SMU. Um, uh, yes, with, with they, all that off, all that offensive firepower, I think a lot of people, and I think it's fair, looked at SMU last year and saw you know they won a bunch of close, they won some close games, uh, they had a very high powered offense, they sort of tailed off a little bit toward the end of the year, and well, maybe they're good, but last year they overachieved a little bit. They'll come back to the pack this year, and you know so far that offense is still humming pretty good they just put like almost what like 70 on north texas last week um so i think they're a factor too with a lot of really good players coming back and shane bouchelle a quarterback um and, and a whole you know some transfers coming in there because that's what sunny does on that side of it yeah so the americans well, got a chance I, to be I'd really my, really good i'd make my doctor shane bouchelle joke but the thing is brady white at memphis is actually pursuing a doctorate right now <laughs> and and he could come back next year because everybody gets a free year this year yeah. Conceivably, he could be a seventh year senior. It's pretty good. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Andy, weren't you a seventh year senior at some point? You- <laughs> uh, I wish. I wish. I, I only spent four years in college and immediately regretted it as soon as I left. No. I had some friends that did the five year play, and I was like, you guys. You guys are much smarter than I am. Because I think, Andy, I think you got the same thing that I got, that, that I got from my parents, which is you get, you get four years. If you're not done in four no. years, you're paying no, my, for it. My, I pay. I, they didn't pay a penny for the first okay. four years. So, okay. No, mine was we've saved up a few thousand dollars for your college, and you're now 16 years old. Would you like us to put this toward a gently used Toyota Corolla, <laughs> or would you like us to put it toward college? I was like, I will take the car and get college paid for. <laughs> Well done. Well done. Okay, I want to take a very quick break here, and then I want to dive into the SEC with Andy Staples from The Athletic. You're listening to the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. We're back on the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. Joining me today is Andy Staples from The Athletic. You can hear him at least three times a week, sometimes more on the Andy Staples Show podcast. And uh, Andy, so so yeah, the SEC gets rolling this week. Uh, not like the greatest SEC schedule, but considering where we are and where we thought we might not even see any SEC football this year, any SEC football is good football. But clearly, it looked like they made this schedule with the idea of, you know, if things are not quite perfect on the 20, what is it, 26th this weekend, um, and we got to cancel some of these games, and maybe we won't be too bad, bad off canceling some of these games. So we have, you know, Alabama going to Missouri, and we have Arkansas against, uh, against uh, Georgia. 
the SEC fed its uh, its lower level teams to the Wolves when they redid the schedule. So poor Arkansas got Georgia and Florida and Missouri got LSU and Alabama. The one game that sort of stands out to me, and then I'll ask you if there's any anyone else, is this this Kentucky Auburn game could be pretty interesting. Uh, and this could be sort of a tone setter, I think, for two teams that fancy themselves as division contenders. But if you lose this game, now all of a sudden you're sort of in a hole. But if you win this game, this is that sort of, you know, sort of 50 50 game that makes you feel like, oh, now, now we're in, now we're in position to really do some things. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one because it's one of those, if Kentucky were to win this game, they will think this sky is falling at Auburn which is not necessarily the case. Kentucky could be very good this year. Now, as we record this, we still don't know what's going to happen with Joey Gatewood. Uh, Mark Stoops insists there is no quote-unquote gentleman's agreement between Kentucky and Auburn for Auburn to support Joey Gatewood's eligibility this season in return for him not playing against Auburn. You know, Joey Gatewood is the quarterback who left Auburn and transferred to Kentucky. But Terry Wilson will, will... should be the starting quarterback for Kentucky against Auburn. Well, so, but, but it should also be noted that Stoops has insisted that you know, right? Wilson's a quarterback. Wilson's a quarterback, and you right. know, and that wouldn't necessarily right. That wasn't necessarily going to change with Gatewood. Right. And plus, Terry Wilson, Wilson was Wilson, probably going to be the starter, whether Gatewood could play or not. Most likely, I, I think. I think that's probably the case. Who knows if if it's a regular season and and Gatewood's been playing since you know the spring? But right, considering everything, how we got here, Wilson was probably going to be the starter. Yeah, and the thing is that the Kentucky offensive line should be pretty good. You know, you look at at, at, at Darian Kennard, Landon Young, Drake Jackson. There's some pretty good players on that on, on that line. So I would imagine they're going to be able to move the ball a little bit. I'm excited to see this Auburn offense with Bo Nix. You know, in his second year because he had some moments last year as a true freshman where like where you're like, oh. Golly, he looks like a true freshman. But then you saw the end of the Oregon game. You saw the Iron Bowl where he looked like a guy who could be pretty special down the road if the things go the right way. So, you know, I, I'm excited to see that. And I'm excited to see him with Chad Morris as the offensive coordinator because the Chad Morris tenure at Arkansas was so bad that I think we've forgotten that Chad Morris is a pretty good offensive coach, mm-hmm. that he was good at SMU when he was the head coach there. He helped build Clemson's offense, you know, laid the foundation for what it was going to be and convinced Deshaun Watson to go there. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's a guy who Gus trusts completely. And I don't think he's going to have an issue with, you know, because you remember Gus took back the play calling reins last year. He has since given them willingly to Chad Morris. And you know, the history of this is when Gus was a high, a high school coach in Arkansas and Chad Morris was a high, high school coach in Texas, they very much shared notes quite a bit on how, you know, how offensive football should be played. Uh, they were considered kind of the cutting edge guys in each of their states and they they were good friends. And so I'm excited to see how that relationship works, because I think those two together, especially in a year like this, where I feel like. Because of COVID, because of personnel limitations you're going to have, you know, week to week, you don't exactly know what you're going to have. A lot of stuff's going to have to be drawn up in the dirt. And I'll take the two guys who were state champion high school coaches drawing stuff in the dirt and figuring out different ways to use people because that's what you have to do when you're a high school coach. Like, I think it's very interesting that this is all happening this year when those two guys are together. Yeah, I'll be very interested to see what that all, uh, offense looks like as well. They've got really interesting playmakers on the outside, really fast receivers, and, and if Knicks could sort of exploit them, what they don't have is that sort of obvious bell cow running back, and we don't know what Auburn's offensive line is going to look like this year. Um, so it, you, you just find yourself thinking like it, like just what you said, like Gus's offense is so inside, run heavy, and really that's we always think of Gus's offense being at its best when it's that. And Nick's was looked like a freshman for so so much of last year and never really maximized what he had on the outside with those receivers. And if they could find the right blend there, this could look like a completely different offense. This, this could look completely different from last year. Um, 
and you're probably not going to have the defense to lean on as much as, as heavily as you did last year because you well, don't have like, those two mon- you don't have a couple of those monsters up front and the secondary's been depleted. And Seth Williams doesn't get as much pub as as some of the other really good receivers in the SEC. And and look, let's be honest, Jalen Waddell, Devontae Smith, potential first round guys. Uh, Jamar Chase at LSU last year was the Blitnikoff winner. It's a crowded so room trying to get yeah, yeah in the SEC it's, trying, it's, trying to get it's hard to, to get, get attention. attention as an SEC receiver. But Seth Williams is a really good one. And then you've got Anthony Schwartz, who is the fastest player in college football, like laser timed fastest player in college football. They haven't quite figured out all the best ways to use him yet. But that's another thing I, I'm intrigued by. What is Chad Morris cooked up for this guy? Because you would think he could be a pretty good weapon. What else looks interesting to you in the SEC? Again, you've got Alabama should be just fine. And, you know, well, the one actually, I'll say this. The one that jumps out to me, the other one is, is the Pirate going to LSU and what, what yeah. Mississippi State looks like under Leach against uh, an LSU team that, I mean, is maybe the most fascinating team in the country just because of all, all that it lost, but all it still retains. Well, that's the thing. I was looking at the LSU depth chart that got released on Monday, and I was like, wow, there are not a lot of bold names on here. <laughs> bold names are the returning starters, by the way. And there, there are not many of them. <laughs> and, but they've recruited so well since Ed Orgeron took over. I'm really not worried about LSU. I am not worried. Like, maybe they're not national championship caliber this year, but they are interesting all season caliber. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not worried about them in terms of talent. I'm curious to see what Mississippi State looks like under Mike Leach. Uh, K.J. Costello, we assume, will be the starting quarterback. I mean, Gary Schrader's already been moved receiver. So, you know, that's that's what we can expect. And and Costello at Stanford played the much more complex offense. The, the air rate's easier to learn, and you've seen people come right in and perform well. I mean, Gardner Minshew came in as a transfer and took over that offense and was fantastic in it, you know. So – it's doable. The question is, from a talent standpoint, can Mississippi State hold up against LSU? Because you saw last year how big that gap was. And, and it's, it's interesting because Mississippi State LSU has been kind of a, a benchmark for that. Because remember Orgeron's first full season as the head coach? They went to Starkville and Mississippi State just annihilated them. Because mm-hmm. LSU had basically three healthy defensive linemen. It was, it was basically an indictment of latter day less miles recruiting like they were so bad on both lines of scrimmage at lsu and then last year you saw how far they'd come in two years of recruiting under under ed orgeron so my guess is you're still going to see that talent gap and but i am fascinated with with leach and mississippi state because even though there is a talent gap where has leach ever been that there wasn't a talent gap there's there's a talent gap between Texas Tech and a lot of the, the, the upper crust schools in the Big 12. There's a talent gap between Washington State and upper crust schools in the Pac-12, and he still managed to win. This will still be the most talented team that Mike Leach has ever had. From a, from a purely athletic standpoint, this will be the most talented, most athletic team he's ever had. The difference is that will also be the most athletic competition he's ever faced. Right. So relative to the competition, we'll see how it works out. And you say it, 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 without question, it is a it is a it is an easier offense, quote unquote, easier offense to to learn and to grasp, especially if you're a guy like KJ. You would think if you're a guy like KJ Costello. If you're very smart. I mean, think about you're, it. Gardner Minshew is exceptionally intelligent. But, but Gardner Minshew had played in a bunch of offenses. So he, he had like he understood all of the basic concepts. And so it was easier for him to internalize what Mike Leach was teaching him and then perform it on the field. I think KJ Costello would probably be in the same boat. It's also a heavy repetition though. What what Leach will always Mm -hmm. say that we don't do a ton of things, but there's a lot of things that, are sort of uh, it's a lot. Of, it's almost option football, right? If if the defense does mm-hmm. this, we do this. We react to yep. what the defense is doing. So it's heavy repetition, and I just don't know what kind of repetition they've been ma- yeah. able to have that's, in an off season where everything's been blown up. Yeah, that's the part you wonder about because this would have been done in spring football, and then would have been layered upon doing voluntary workouts, seven on seven type stuff over the summer. And and you're right because the repetition they do is. I'm a receiver. I see the defense is doing, doing this coverage. 
I know where the green space is going to be. And I go find the green space. And the quarterback knows that I'm going to find the green space. Mm -hmm. And so that is just rep, 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 rep. And so it'll be interesting to see in the first game, how much of that is there, how much of, of, cause I would be, I wouldn't be shocked if you have situations where the quarterback and the receivers aren't necessarily on the same page. Quarterback thinks the receiver is going to go one way. Receiver ends up going another. And it's not because KJ Costello comes from Stanford where there's a very traditional route tree. You're, you're going to do this. Now there, there are some variations on it based on coverage, but for the most part, you're going to do this. You're going to do this. It's a different sort of a different language in the air raid where you're, you're more looking for a space than this is what the play calls for. I'm going, so that means I'm going to run this route. Or if this guy is here, I am then going to run this route. Air raid is more trying to find a little bit of open space. So I, I, I am curious about that, but it's going to be fun. It's, I mean, it's Mike Leach in the SEC. We've been, we've been waiting for this. The other place that's going to be fun in the SEC in Mississippi is at Ole Miss because it's Lane Kiffin. <laughs> it's Lane Kiffin at, at, in Oxford. And we will see what that looks like when Florida comes to town this weekend. Now, now the Gators uh, are expecting big things in, in Dan Mullins. I think this is Dan Mullins' third year. Third year. Third yeah. year. Yeah. So, I mean, at this point, they're, they're expecting to maybe beat Georgia and and play for play in a playoff. I mean, they're, they're, wanting, they're wanting to win an SEC championship. Just just being in contention is no longer the thing there. Uh, and they may have the pieces to do that. Uh, interested to see what happens with Ole Miss. We talked we talked a lot of, a lot about quarterbacks, right? They've got um, uh, John Reese John Reese Plumley, right? It's Reese John Rice. It's Rice. Rice. Oh, John Rice Plum, Plumley, who is a hell of a runner and worked great for Rich Rodriguez last year in that offense. But Matt Corral might be the better fit in Lane Kiffin's offense. And you know, again, we haven't had a lot of access to these teams. But if you read the reports coming out of coming out of Mississippi, sounds like Corral might be the first guy taking snaps uh even though both might play on saturday um you know what do you think about the gators and and, and old miss i mean, what are you looking for out of that matchup i mean florida should be able to win this game pretty easily just because old miss's roster is still fairly depleted florida's offense I mean, of, of all the the teams that were kind of set up to to deal with some of the difficulties that the the pandemic is thrown at, at football teams and, and the limitations in practice. Florida's, I mean, think about some veteran receivers that, that even though they have four receivers from last year's team that are rookies in the NFL right now, they spread the ball around so much. I think they had 11 guys catch double digit passes last year. So they've got three guys that have played quite a bit. And I mean, Kyle Pitts is, is a tight end officially, but I mean, he's a wide receiver. He's he's a he's the best cat pass catching threat they have. But then you also have Trevon Grimes, you have Jacob Copeland, who who played decent roles last season, who will not be surprised by anything that they see. So you would imagine that Florida's offense should be humming pretty good from the get-go. As far as what Ole Miss can do, I think you gotta go to to Lane Kiffin's first year at FAU when he had Kendall Bryles as his offensive coordinator because uh, he brought in Jeff Levy as his offense coordinator this year. Those are these are all guys who were, you know, Kendall Browse is Art Browse's yeah, son. They're all, they're all Baylor based. Yeah. Jeff yeah. Levy is Art Browse's son-in-law, mm-hmm. so they they work together at Baylor. Um, you know, they, they've got Jeff Levy brought his offensive line coach that that was with Art Browse forever as well. So I mean, expect that type of offense. Expect you know receivers out wide of the numbers. It's going to move fast. Uh, if you hit a big play downfield, you're going to be handed off immediately trying to get like eight, nine yards on the ground. Um, the fact that, that Ole Miss has Jerry and Ely and I, I mean, they, and, and Snoop Connor too, they've got a pretty good running game, whether the quarterback is a part of that or not. And that's what, that's what made me think, okay, Matt Corral's got a lot better chance than people think. Cause you know, going into the, the preseason, people were like, Oh, John Rice plumley has got that job. Look what he did against LSU last year. That's true. But remember what happened at the Egg Bowl. Matt Corral was the guy that they put in at the end, and he took him down the field. And mm-hmm. obviously, there was a there was a, there was an incident, and somebody pretended to pee on the field, and then they missed the extra point. But but yeah, so Matt Corral in that offense is interesting. I, I think there's there's a place to play two quarterbacks. I talked to Lane Kiffin about this about a month ago, and 
he's always been of the mind that if you got two quarterbacks, you got no quarterback. Mm-hmm. But I think this is different. This is, you know, what's the one two quarterback system that actually worked? Chris Leak and Tim Tebow, because they had very clearly defined roles. You can do that in this offense with very clearly defined roles. The thing about Plumley is he's a good enough thrower that you have to respect. You have to respect it when he's on the field. If you didn't, then I don't know that he's he'd be as effective as a runner, uh, as effective a runner as he is. So, you know, I, I just think it really depends on what what that staff wants out of that offense. I mean, you could run for three hundred yards a game if Plumley's your guy, but you also have good enough backs that if you want to you want to throw a little more and then mix that in, it could be pretty dangerous because that's the one thing those Baylor offenses nobody ever talked about was they ran for five yards of carry. I mean, they were always near the top of the big 12 and rushing. They won a bowl. They won a bowl game with a running back playing quarterback. Right. Right. <laughs> what are you receiver? With Jefferson, was, right. Wasn't yeah. Jefferson was the kid's name and, and I, well, whatever he was, he wasn't a quarterback and they played North Carolina and they ran for about yeah. 400 yards yeah, they in a, in a, ran in a the option, yeah, in so. an Arizona bowl. And so, yeah, you could, they, no, they, they put up huge numbers uh, on the ground at Baylor when, you know, in the, in the best years of Bryles. And a lot, and a lot of that is uh, some of that is tempo. And some of that is just the way the offense works, because the reason they have those receivers so wide is they, they want to make you tell them what you're doing with your safeties. Yeah. Clear the they, box they, a little bit. Yeah. They want to look at the safeties and see where they are. Count the box up. Do, do you have a linebacker kind of wandering backward? Cause if you've, if you've got your four defensive linemen and one linebacker in the box, they're going to hand off every time. And with Jerry and Ely, they're going to gain five or six yards. So I, I think that's the thing. Now, Against the the teams that have really good defensive lines, this is and this is the thing with that offense that I was always curious about. We never got to see it really against an SEC power. If you've got the kind of defensive talent that most really good SEC teams have, where you've got corners that can cover one on one on the outside, and you've got really good defensive linemen where four people can can get pressure without a blitz. I'm not sure that offense is all that effective well, because you, you, you still can do different things with your linebackers and your safeties. One of the themes that came out of this past weekend a little bit, and Pete Thamel brought it up, and I saw some, you know, Bill Conley and uh, Chris Brown. People don't know Chris Brown, you know, uh, smart football on Twitter. He's written a couple of really good X's and O's books. Uh, he's also a lawyer, I believe. I think he's a financial. He does like, merger, he does like mergers and acquisitions. Yeah, like, yeah. So in his, in his spare time, he, he does, he's a really good X's and O's guy. So I would recommend he's been on the show. I recommend a follow of him on Twitter. They've talked about sort of the uh, is the Baylor offense. Are people catching up to it? Because Syracuse hasn't done very well this year. Um, maybe I, I can't remember. There was another team that they used in as an example. Maybe it was Oklahoma State, though. Gundy's offense has not been quite Baylor, but you know they've gone through a lot of different coordinators. Well, Gundy's Gundy's offense. They they liked what Dana Holgerson brought, and they basically tried to copy that. Mm-hmm every year since since the one year Holgerson was there. So that's more of a more of an air raid. And even though our brows did work for Mike Leach for a little while, the air raid and the brows offense are different offenses. They are very different <laughs> offenses. Right. They are absolutely the very different offense of, of <laughs> offenses though. But there was this conversation coming out of the weekend about like, well, have people caught up to the Baylor offense? Because A, just in general people have caught, sort of caught up to tempo. I mean, that's something that's gone about for the last couple of years. I mean, you know, Gus is a good example, right? I mean, even to, you can even go back to Dabo when they moved on from Chad Morris, they realized, you know, a tempo has its place, but we don't have to be all fast all the time. I, two years ago, I wrote, I wrote a story about how defenses had sort were adjusting to tempo, uh, through personnel being more diverse and more, uh, more variant, um, Basically, uh, more versatile, more versatile personnel, um, being able to call plays quicker or have built in checks on your defense. So, uh, you, so your defense can quickly go from A to B fast, or you're just, comp- uh, uh, or you're just, uh, sort of minimizing the way you call your defense and C by sort of half cheating, right? <laughs> by basically telling your defensive lineman to like get up slowly or, well, to, and, like, and, and there's been a, a shift in personnel. I mean, just look at Alabama. Alabama's defense 
Right. A lot of this look is at, personnel look, based. Look at, look a lot at what of his they personnel look like based. in 2009 right. versus what they look like now. I, I, Nick Saban, when Nick Saban started playing five DBs that were all recruited as corners, that's when everybody else kind of caught on. Like, okay. So we just need to, we need to adjust what we think about personnel wise. Everybody's you, you got, s- everybody's got a, a not, well, everybody doesn't have a player as good as Minka Fitzpatrick, but everybody is trying to find a player right. on a defense, which is essentially their Minka. Like we could possibly put you on in the slot. We could possibly use you as a little kind of a linebacker. We could also usually use you as kind of a safety. And you have yeah. at least one player on every defense that, ostensibly has that job and and often you have one or two players where you have also like an end who could sort of be a linebacker and that's like so you will have at least two or three players on every defense nowadays who can play multiple positions and that's how you stop the, the that's how you deal with tempo because then you can have the same personnel running different defenses yeah which is what which is exactly what tempo offenses do it's the same that they run the same different packages out of the same personnel grouping. The, and so the thing with the bail the defense is a few years. Yeah. The thing with the Baylor offense, I think one of the conversations was because it is very simple, right? It's we're going to keep these wide receivers way out to the side and we're not doing a ton of, we talk about like how simple the air raid is The the Baylor offense is much more simple when it comes to route trees and things like that. A lot of times it's just, okay, you two run deep, you two run eight yards and stop. Right. And mm-hmm. that's pretty yeah. much it. And the court and the quarterback's count in the box. And he's pretty sure he already know it, it, there. There may be some RPO in there, but a lot of times he knows whether he's handing off or throwing pre-snap and just because he's counted the box. Right. So so there's been some conversation that, that that offense has been sort of caught up to. And we'll see. We'll see how that works out. And that's why I, I am fascinated to see what Lane might do, because Lane's always been a very creative guy offensively, too. If, if he's sort of incorporating because he's had Kendall, he had Kendall for a couple of years. And if he's going to and he brings in Letty, if they're going to try to make the Baylor offense work. But how will they make the Baylor offense work? What variations of the Baylor offense will work for old? miss or will Ole Miss try well, and, and, and that's the thing with with Lane there don't expect it to look just like what he ran at FAU when Kendall Bryles was there or what what the Bryles offense was at Baylor Lane's offenses are pretty bespoke like think about the differences between the 2014 Alabama offense and the 2015 Alabama offense and the 2016 Alabama offense those are three very different things all based around the same you know, the same playbook, but run in very different ways. So I, I think he'll, he'll build it around what he's got. The thing is, and this is what he told me with Corral and Rice Plumley or, or John Rice Plumley is you're essentially building two different offenses. Mm-hmm. One, one for Corral and one for John Rice Plumley. And you know what? Maybe that's doable. Maybe, maybe you can, maybe that works. So the last thing we'll, we'll, before we get you out of here is we were all looking forward to trips to Mississippi this off season that didn't come about because we were all going to go do the story of Lane Kiffin's in Oxford, Mike Leach is in Starkville. Isn't this a wonderful place to be? Then this past week, Mississippi football got even more interesting because Deion Sanders is now the coach of Jackson State. If anybody's ever been to Jackson State, and I have been to Jackson State because I lived in Jackson, Mississippi for a few years. And when I was uh, covering... I've been to Millsaps College, man. I I live not far from Millsaps and really not that far from Jackson State, quite frankly. They're pretty close together. Yeah. Jackson State, in fact, the year I I started covering sports in Jackson, they had two first round draft picks, Rashad Anderson and Sylvester Morris, if people remember those two guys. Yeah, it was pretty wild. They had a corner and a wide receiver who were both really, really good. Anyway, so Dion is now... You know, Dion had come up in a couple of coaching searches, like the Florida State, and it was sort of laughed at, like, ha ha ha, no, nobody's going to hire Dion. He's never he's never coached before, though he's done some coaching at the high school level. Jackson State kind of went for it, and they and they you know busted out all the stops, and they had a big uh, introductory press conference with Dion yesterday. And I don't know if is this the start of a coaching career for Dion that should be taken seriously. You're in Florida, so you may have better intel on this. Like, what should we make of 
this for Dion? Is he serious about trying to make a career that is goes well beyond Jackson State, or was he just looking to sort of get in the game and see what happens? Well, I think he, he wants to see what happens, but I mean, if, if you Google Prime Prep, it, his administrative experience to this point has not been all that great. So, <laughs> uh, you know, his name came up in the Florida State thing because he put his name into the Florida sure, State thing. Sure. So, yeah, I, I think I I, I want to see it. <laughs> I want to see what he can do because the Prime Prep thing was it was a different. Yeah, it's a different animal because that's high school in texas you know you're dealing with a lot of politics with high school football in texas oh really you either, think yeah <laughs> yeah so so we've heard but either he'll be able to coach or he won't and you know jackson state will either be good under Deion sanders or they won't and and we'll know you know we'll, we'll know if he's a good coach or not so i just i, I don't want to dismiss it out of hand because he may be great at it now, I, I I feel like you should give anybody a chance, and no doubt, certainly they're going to get attention from a recruiting standpoint. When Deion Sanders is interested in you, that's pretty big news. Which is what they, which is kid. what they really wanted. Which is what they yeah. really wanted. Yep. Yeah. So well, let's see what he can do. Let's give the guy a shot. <laughs> I, I I think it'll be entertaining, if nothing else. It'll be entertaining. It'll get them some attention. And when you're at Jackson State, a program like that in the SWAC, the the attention alone is is worth is worth something. It's worth a lot. But I am just fascinated to see if he can do this from the the idea of, of actually putting a program together, right? I mean, like the 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 fact of the matter is, there's a lot of stuff that goes into running a a college football program that involves, especially at that level, that involves a lot of like, you know, nitty gritty work, right? I mean, yeah. it's, you know, especially in the SWAC, like, I mean, we're not at the point where you're all, you're drawing the lines on the field. You're not that, that level, but you're just doing a lot of hands-on dirty work when you deal with that level. And I'd be interested to see if this works and if he's going to embrace that, because it would be really fascinating if a, if a guy who's as big a star as Deion Sanders does really embrace that. And all of a sudden, a couple Couple of years from now, we're thinking, wow, maybe Deion Sanders can can really do this and and can really move on to bigger and better things in well, coaching. That's the, that's the thing. If you're successful at that level, you're working your ass off. Like yeah. it's hard work. It's a, there. There are not. It's not Alabama where there's 90 people there to do something for you. You're a lot of times there's you. So we'll we'll see exactly how bad Dion wants to be successful as a coach because he will have to work very hard to be successful there. Andy Staples is from The Athletic. You can read his work at The Athletic. You can also listen to him about two or three, or three at least three times a week and sometimes more on The Andy Staples Show. Andy, man, it's been great to actually, well, we talked pretty much all football and I'm going to knock on whatever wood that we actually get as many games as we're hoping for this weekend. And hopefully we'll have a chance to circle back around and, uh, and talk some more football. Cause it was nice to talk real hardcore football. <laughs> it feels almost normal. It does. It almost. almost feels normal. Andy, maybe we'll see you soon as well. All right. Bye, Ralph. And now three and out first down, maybe the most interesting game of the weekend will go on outside the power five. Number 22 Army is at number 14 Cincinnati. The Black Knights have blasted their first two opponents, but neither Middle Tennessee State nor Louisiana Monroe is expected to be particularly good this year. Cincinnati tuned up against Austin P last week. I think we're pretty safe to assume Cincinnati is going to be very good this year, bringing back most of a double-digit win team last year. Uh, as ferocious as Army has looked, this is a huge step up in competition. I know Army's triple option offense should be solid. What I want to see is how that defense holds up. MTSU and ULM didn't put up much of a fight, but Cincinnati has the type of size and athleticism that is tough for Army's high risk defense to stop consistently. Second down, Virginia Tech finally gets its season started after having a couple of games postponed because of COVID issues. NC State comes to Blacksburg off a high-scoring victory against Wake Forest last week. Encouraging sign for the Wolfpack, which was broken offensively for most of last year, bouncing from one ineffective quarterback to another. 
Virginia Tech is ranked this week, number 20, a beneficiary of the Big Ten and Pac-12 teams not being in the rankings. It's been such an interesting 18 months or so for Justin Fuente's program. It feels like the Hokies are finally, truly his now, and we can start determining exactly what that will look like. Third down. So I guess Andy didn't knock enough wood, or maybe I just spoke too soon. Not long after I was done recording this podcast, it was actually being edited. News broke that Notre Dame and Wake Forest, scheduled for Saturday, was being postponed. Notre Dame has 13 players who tested positive in isolation and another 10 in quarantine as close contacts. That makes 18 FBS games that have been postponed or canceled since August 26, including three ACC games. Yet another reminder that this isn't going to be easy, folks. That's the show for today. I'd like to thank my producer, Sarah McCrory, for making me sound good. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Westwood One Podcasts. Please subscribe so you do not miss an episode. I'm Ralph Russo, the college football writer with the Associated Press. Thanks for listening and come back for more next week of the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast.